I'm the youth and I'm the youth and family services manager at KCLS, and I'm very excited to introduce our guest tonight. Alice Beasley is a renowned artist who uses fabric as her medium of expression. Her work has been exhibited nationally, including at the American Folk Art Museum and the Smithsonian Anacostia Museum, as well as internationally in Spain, France, Japan, and Namibia. Her work has been purchased or commissioned by many entities, including the De Young Museum, the City and County of San Francisco, the County of Alameda, Kaiser Hospital, and more. The King County Library System is delighted and privileged to have her as our guest tonight. With that, I will turn it over to Ms. Beasley. So did you want my picture up or video? <laughs> Hello. We can see you, Alice. Oh, you can. Okay. I can't see me, but I, that doesn't matter. I've seen me before. Thank you for coming to visit with me. Um, I've been asked to share with you some of the artwork that I've been doing for the last 30 or more years. A lot of my work has uh, told the story of my family in one way or another, and I'll be sharing some of that with you. I think it's uh, particularly appropriate um, as we near Juneteenth. But before I do that, I should tell you a little bit about my background. For 35 years, I was an attorney by profession. Since my retirement in 2007, I call myself a recovering lawyer. Now, practicing law is very stressful under the best of circumstances. And I found the need to uh, be able to, in my spare time, to create and make something beautiful, um, to get away from all the antagonism of uh, a litigation career. As a result, I've been making art quilts for more than 30 years. Now, they're probably not the type of quilts that you are most familiar with. My quilts are not made to um, cover your beds. They're made exclusively to hang on your walls. The reason I chose fabric as my medium of expression is that I come from a long line of women who made things with their hands. So I grew up knitting and crocheting and sewing, but for whatever reason, I had never tried quilting when I was young. Uh, I'd never done a nine patch or flying geese or any of the traditional patterns you may be familiar with if you're a quilter. I think it's something in my uh, personality that doesn't give me the patience to match little triangles with perfect one quarter inch seams. In fact, if there is a character tra trait that I have in abundance, it's the desire to be always doing something different. If I've done something once, it bores me to tears to do it a second time. Makes me kind of a lousy housekeeper. I figure if you vacuumed once, what's the interest in ever doing that again? Because I didn't come up through the ranks of traditional quilting, I also never really learned the fundamentals of quilting. My first quilts had no batting because I didn't know they were supposed to. I used raw edge applique in the beginning because I didn't know you were supposed to turn the edges under. Only later did it actually become a technique that uh, helps to advance um, my art. And I'll talk more about that later. Uh, in short, I got to make up my own rules and stumble along my own path. The point is I made my first quilt, not because I wanted to make a bed covering, but because I wanted to make art. And I wanted my quilts to satisfy the rules of art. And I was much less concerned, if concerned at all, about the rules of the quilting police. Now I'm not trained as an artist, but I have always been drawn to it and to the desire to create something that's never been done before. So some 30 years ago, I had an idea that it ought to be possible to make a portrait by using fabric instead of paint. That was a crazy idea at the time because no one was making fabric portraits. So I had no teachers or role models. My first quilt was a really dismal affair. It violated equally the laws of art and of quilting. But I thought, well, there's a kernel of worth there. So I kept at it. For the first few years, I had absolutely no idea how I did these things. Each one I expected to be my last. 
My goal from the beginning, and particularly as it has evolved, has, to been, has been to make art that was not folk art or abstract art, but rather to make realistic portraits of people and things, just in a different medium. It took me about six years to make something that I thought was halfway decent. That was this piece that I call Night Lily. Slide, please. Uh, just... Next slide. Thank you. Um, that was this piece called Night Lily. It was done in 1994. Now, one of the things you'll notice from this piece and that continues throughout my work is the use of print fabrics to create the effects of skin and hair. I almost never use solid color fabrics, especially to show skin because skin is alive, it has texture. Solid color fabrics for me are just way too dull. They absorb light uniformly, which is not what the human skin does with its bumps and whirls and ridges and swirls. Um, one of my few quilting rules is that I don't paint on or draw on these quilts. Every effect that you see comes from the fabric itself, from the patterns in the fabrics and the textures in the fabrics. I, for me, I just find it more interesting than uh, adding the uh, effects by a paintbrush or a drawing pencil. Next slide. This is a quilt I did in 2009 after the election of President Obama. Next slide. And this is a detail of it. In this case, I downloaded many different photos of Obama to use as a reference. Now, when I'm doing an actual person, I usually like to do a drawing first because if I can draw it, I know that I can do it in fabric. But for some reason, I was having a very difficult time drawing Obama. Finally, because it was, I was under a deadline to produce this piece for a show, I just gave up drawing and went directly to trying to create the fabric portrait by simply looking at a photo of him and cutting various fabric shapes, shapes directly without the use of a template. For reasons I can't quite explain, I had no difficulty doing his face in fabric, even though I couldn't get it right on paper. I call it the Mr. Potato Head effect. If an eye is too small or too large, if it's placed too low or too high on the face, I can just take it off and fix it or move it rather than having to erase and start over as I might with drawing on a paper. In any event, you will see that I use many different fabrics to replicate highlights, shadows, planes, and contours on Obama's face. I use fabrics with lines and dots and patterns, whatever would give me the feeling of the texture of skin. Now, when I'm making pictures of actual people, I usually work from photographs. I made a portrait of my mother as a baby with her father, my grandfather. Next. Now, this is a picture of my mother that I started with. This photo was probably taken in about 1914. And I think she was just as cute as a bug in this picture. Next. And this is the photo of her father, my grandfather. I wanted to combine them into a single portrait, uh, one in which she would be sitting on his knee. And this is what I came up with. Next. It's called All My Roads Lead Back to You. Because the photo of my grandfather was taken much later in his life than what would have corresponded to my mother as a baby, I had to regress his age in this final portrait. But I've also told my family story in a much more sweeping view. A few years ago, I did a piece for an exhibition on migration that was shown at the Textile Museum in Washington, DC. It's called Bloodline, next. And it recreates the story of my ancestors from slavery to today through the metaphor of a railroad train. The notion is that the journey of my family has been like a train that picks up people at one place and moves them through time, depositing them in some other place. Because that's the story of the African-American migration. Next. In the first car, we see the migration from Africa through uh, what, what uh, became popularly known as the Door of no, no Return, which is really a portal in Dakar, Senegal. 
uh, through which captured people were loaded onto slave ships for the Americas. Now in the center, um, you see the African family members. They're leaving behind um, their loved one or their loved ones are, are being taken away from them. They're dressed in bright colors while they mourn their lost family members. On the two sides, you see the captives. Next. They have no color, no faces, because they have begun the process of having their identities stripped from them, something that will be completed in the new world. Unlike the subsequent train cars on this car, the only ceiling uh, is the forest canopy. For those who are not enslaved, their future had not been circumscribed by the limits placed on them by a white society that held them in contempt. So the sky was their limit. Next. And then in the second car, we see 245 years of my family's history as an enslaved people in this country. Unlike the African car where the, tree, uh, where the trees were open to the sky, this car has a rusty iron roof no doors, no escape. And below in the center, we see the, we see the people packed in as though, uh, as they would have been during the, the middle passage to America on the ship that brought them to this country. And in the back, you also see the white slave masters because they are in my family tree as well. In conjunction with doing this piece, I had my DNA done and it shows that more than 30% of my heritage is British, Irish, and Scandinavian, Scandinavian, which is common for African-American people. And believe me, these unnamed white ancestors did not date their way into my family history, nor did they leave their family fortunes for us to inherit. Next. Finally, in this third car are my direct ancestors. I used family portraits to print their faces onto silk fabric. I then constructed everything else, their bodies, the train seats, the floor, the luggage, et cetera, from fabric. This last car is the story of my family's migration from the Jim Crow South to the North. And that's me on the right, uh, on the right at the end, recording everything on my cell phone because, well, what else would you do? Next. And this is a, um, a picture of the entire piece as it was installed at the Textile Museum in Washington, DC. In conjunction with doing the bloodline piece, I also did several small nine by tens that were about my immediate family. Next. This first one is called Back of the Bus. The man seated in the foreground is my uncle Dan, one of my father's four brothers. Now my father's family was born in Tuskegee, Alabama, the heart of Jim Crow. Like a lot of young black men, Uncle Dan saw service as a soldier in World War II, which opened his eyes to a world outside of the Jim Crow South. When he came back home to Tuskegee, Alabama in 1945, he began trying to register to vote. As he explained it, I was a college graduate, I had been in the army, I'd never been in jail. I just figured I ought to be registered. Every conceivable roadblock was thrown in front of him and any others who wanted to exercise their right to vote. It would take another 20 years before the white wall of subterfuge, intimidation and violence began to crumble to allow blacks access to the ballot box. Finally, in 1970, Uncle Dan became the first black person since reconstruction elected to public office in Macon County, Alabama. Next. And this is a picture of my great uncle Edgar Edmund as a World War I soldier. During World War I, one million African Americans, including Uncle Edgar, received draft notices and some 370,000 were inducted into the army. These returning soldiers, having seen a version of life outside of the color bar, were the initial impetus for the great migration of African Americans out of the Jim Crow South. In this piece, I used a photo of Black World War I of, uh, company of soldiers in the background. And then I constructed Great Uncle Edgar um, out of fabric, having um, 
copied his face onto a piece of fabric. Next. And this is my mother's Aunt C. Now that wasn't really her name. Her name was Azalea, but my mother couldn't say Aunt Z, I can't either actually, as a baby, so she became forever Aunt C. She was a part of my mother's family's migration from Memphis to Detroit, which I talk about more in the next slide. But this is how I picture Aunt C, waiting to leave her home in Memphis for the great unknown of Detroit. Next. Now this piece is called Mama, Me, and the 41 Ford. My mother's migration story was more complicated than some. As a baby, she moved from Memphis to Detroit with her parents, sister, aunts, and uncles. She grew up in Detroit, but when the depression came, she took a job with the VA hospital in Tuskegee, Alabama. Now that hospital was con constructed in 1923 with the purpose of providing care for the black veterans of World War I. Care denied them at most other veterans facilities in the Jim Crow South. But because it was segregated, it also provided a harbor of employment for black professionals, such as doctors and nurses. Along with the Tuskegee Institute founded by Booker T. Washington in 1881, Tuskegee came to be seen as a mecca of black achievement. My parents met at the VA where they both worked. They married and had two children there in Tuskegee, one of them being me. After I was born, we all climbed into this 1941 Ford and headed north to live in my mother's hometown, Detroit. Migrants once again. Although I do mostly portraits of peace people, I've also done a fair amount of still lifes as well. Next. This one is called Flying Takeout. Now, I had a couple of things in mind when I did this piece. One was to challenge myself to do glass uh, out of fabric, and in this case, cut glass. To make it, I rely principally on sheer organza fabrics and whites and grays. Now, frequently when I do a still life, I lay the objects out on my table so that I can study the effect of light and shadow on the various components. This one though, frankly, came mostly out of my head and was composed as I went along without the use of a drawing. Next. And this is a detail of that same piece where you can see the shadows and the highlights, um, which I don't just use netting or to make shadows. I use different fabrics because shadows are not just gray blobs. Shadows contain the colors of the objects around them and, uh, and the colors of the objects that they're sitting on. So that's why I use uh, quite a number of different uh, colors of fabrics, especially when I'm creating still lifes. Next. <clears throat> now I really enjoy trying new effects with fabric. Hold on a second. About 15 years ago, I decided to try working with just transparent fabrics, chiefly organzas in a limited color palette. This piece is called No Hard Hats Required and is my comment on the loss of a million or more construction jobs in the wake of the financial meltdown of 2008. It's achieved by layering pieces of sheer organza. Um, and the chain link fence was done through the use of a twin needle, which created little channels that crisscrossed each other. And I've done a number of sheer organza pieces since then. Next. This one is called Remembering Trayvon. It captures the moment when Trayvon looked behind him to see the much older and bigger George Zimmerman following him with a gun in hand. Next. I draw inspiration from a lot of different places. Um, sometimes it's other artists. This piece, for example, came about after I saw the Diebenkorn exhibit at San Francisco MoMA. I came home and wanted to do a piece that honored his color blocking. That piece became this one, the Red Room. For me, I think this is a good example of using another artist for inspiration without copying their work. Now, a lot of my art is political in nature. During the last presidency, 
it became what I did to keep my head from exploding. Next. While I was practicing law, I mainly made art and self-defense from the conflicts of that world. But now, um, during those last four years, one of the main reasons was to allow me to have a voice about issues that I feel passionate about. In this quilt, No Vote, No Voice, I am combining my years as a civil rights lawyer with my art to comment on the Supreme Court's decision to void Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. That decision opened the door for states to adopt ever more draconian voter suppression laws, which had the intent and effect of decreasing voting by minorities. And of course, although this piece was done in 2014, it certainly foreshadows the mad scramble being undertaken today by the states to disenfranchise voters. Next. This is a piece called Blue Burkas. I think that the burqa provokes a lot of both controversy, both from its defenders and its detractors. My intent here was to show the women behind the burqas, that they are, like all women, subject to a wide range of complex emotions, love, fear, innocence, happiness, suspicion, sadness. Next. Uh, actually, can you go back to that one? Thank you. From a purely technical point of view, you'll note that in these, spaces, in these spaces, again, how important it is for me to use fabrics that are not solids. The reason for this is that if you look at the work of painters, you will see that they do not use solid colors of paint. Their brush strokes contain small dabs of several related or contrasting colors. By using multicolored fabrics, especially the ones that have softly blurred rather than crisp designs, we emulate the artist who loads his brush with three or four colors and then makes her stroke. Although the faces, although the colors in the faces in this piece, blue burkas, are rather subtle pastels, sometimes I use highly patterned fabrics to reflect a mood as in this next piece, which is called, I, uh, I was destined to fly. I thought the intensities of the colors on her face reflected the exuberance of her feelings. While I'm talking about fabric choices, let me say a few more words about my process. First of all, as I said, all of my work is raw edge applique, which means I don't turn under edges or seam the individual pieces together. Before I cut into the fabric, fabric I apply a fusible fabric on the back, which allows me to fuse the cut shapes in place. Most of the time I work directly by holding my scissors and cutting directly into the fabric, just as if the scissors were a paintbrush picking up paint from my palette. Because I'm working directly, I can change my mind a hundred times about color and placement and shape and everything as I go along. If I fuse something down and I don't like it, I can simply fuse something else on top of it. On one of my quotes, the woman in it has five different dresses on under the one she ended up with because the other simply didn't look right in context. So, and as I said before, my hard and fast rule is I don't paint on my quilts. So whatever lines and colors you see come from manipulating the fabrics themselves or from my thread line rather than from being painted on. When I am creating, I'm constantly going back and forth between my work tables and my, my design wall putting up the assemblage so that I can see how it works on a vertical surface, surface because things appear much, much different when you view them on a, on a uh, vertical uh, plane than, um, than um, when you see them on a horizontal plane. Generally, I'm designing as I go along. Occasionally, as I said, sometimes I sketch something in advance as I did the faces in blue burkas. Uh, just as frequently, however, I don't. Instead, I'm cutting and assembling as I go along, using my scissors simply uh, similarly to the way I would use a pencil. I begin first by assembling the head. That means I first cut the general shape of the head out of one piece of fabric that is the basic skin tone that I want. But on top of that basic oval, I start adding features. I create the elements of the face in discrete units, eyes, nose, lips, forehead, and so forth and place them on the underlying face, paying attention to light and shadow. I'm constantly adjusting. Is the eye too big 
or small in relation to the rest of the face. If a face is turning away, are the features consistent with how the face is turned? Photos are helpful, but they can be misleading if you try to use them slavishly because the camera actually makes visual compromises that seem correct in a photo, but may not look accurate if you attempt to follow a photo slavishly. As I'm creating it, the piece speaks to me and I have to be able to speak back. They say the art of painting is less in what you put on the canvas than what you subtract after you put it down. I can't be bound to put two pieces of fabric together like a jigsaw puzzle, just because that seemed like a good idea three weeks ago. And as I said, that's why I don't rely slavishly on templates. As the piece goes down, um, the colors relate to each other. And as just juxtapo juxtaposed, they actually change each other. And I have to be able to change anything in response to the emerging picture. And it's the reason I favor raw edge applique rather than piecing. For what I'm doing, piecing creates too hard of an edge. Although it supplies that neatness that the quilt police are fond of, it's sometimes at the expense of allowing the edges of the fabrics to marry softly as brush strokes do in paintings. After I've done the face, which is usually the hardest part, I assemble the rest of the figure, hands, feet, etc. Again, always trying to get things to read accurately. Finally, when the foreground is done, I turn my attention to the background. The reason I start with the foreground first uh, is that the figures will determine the figures themselves will determine the direction that light is coming from, and it will also inform the colors that I choose for the background. When everything is assembled and fused to a muslin backing, I use a straight tip stitch of a very lightweight silk thread, which is designed to blend with the subject and to make sure that everything is secure. Finally, I make the quilt sand sandwich if I'm using batting and I do um, additional though minimal quilting to the final package so that everything holds together. Although I love working with silks, the problem with silk is that as I said, before, I like to work with pattern and fabric, but it can be very hard to find a specific color range of pattern silk. I found myself going to Indian fabric stores, online, a variety of places, but whereas you can find a whole store dedicated to colors and patterns for cotton fabrics, silk, not so much. That ended up leading to beginning to print my own fabrics. I acquired a wide format Epson printer that allows me to print in much larger sizes than an ordinary home copier. And most important, it uses archival pigment based ink so that it has much more permanence than the ink in ordinary copiers. So I use a variety of photographs, some acquired from photo stock services and some that I take myself. I download these photos into Photoshop, manipulate them to more or less extent and then print them via my printer onto white paper backed fabric that I buy in rolls. In, sh in short, I'm creating my own, as though I'm creating my own um, bolt of fabric. Then I cut these fabric pieces up into various small sizes and use them just like commercial fabric. By doing this, I can print onto silk, cotton, organza, charmeuse, all kinds of fabrics and know that I'm getting just the color and just the pattern that I wanted and just the type of fabric that I want. To show you what I mean, I recently did a series of underwater ballets that I call undercurrents. The first one is here, next. It's called Somewhere in Me There Lives Giselle. This background is just a slew of that the water that she uh, is in is just a slew of bits of photos of water and other blue things that I've printed mainly onto silk habitat and layered and angled them to make the motion of the water. Next. The second in that series is why am I not where you are. Um, it's named, although there is a dance called that, um, the pose that he's in suggested to me that in a relationship, you will almost always find one person is there and the other person is there and one of them is saying, why am I not where you are or why are you not where I am? Um, you can see that I not only use my digitally printed fabrics in the background, they're also incorporated into the figure. 
in order to make it appear that this dancer is in the water and not on top of it or in front of it, I used sheer organzas that I had printed uh, on to fuse on top of the cotton fabrics that make up his body. Next. And this is another one in that series called Dance of the Firebird. Each of these pieces is based on a specific ballet, but it, uh, each is set in an unlikely environment, that is, underwater. On these pieces, I've made the, the edges irregular because I think that adds to the motion of the water. Beginning with this pe these pieces, I have dispensed with batting altogether because I don't want loft or pu puffiness. Instead, instead, I now mount almost. Instead, I now mount almost all of my compositions onto felt. Next. I love making lookalikes of objects and fabric. I made this piece called In My Wake for a show about environmental catastrophes in our ocean. I wanted to illustrate the tragedy of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, where 8 million tons of refuse, most of it plastic, are dumped in the ocean every year. This piece is my personal apology to the ocean for any of my trash that may have ended up there because of my own carelessness and lack of sufficient environmental awareness. Rather than viewing this issue as somebody else's sin, I explored my own uncomfortable relationship with refuse. In order to make this piece, I took only disposable items that I found in my home. I set each one up on my design table as a model so that I could make a fabric re recreation of it. While I was doing that, I could examine my own conscience and uh, ask how this thing came into my house. Was there a way it could be reused or recycled? Was there a way to uh, avoid this packaging altogether in the future? As a result, it became a mindful experience for me as well as a work of art. The final pieces I will share with you are, for me, a career high point. Two of my pieces were picked by the De Young Museum in San Francisco for exhibition in their recent De Young Open. Next. This one is called Lord of the Board. The background fabric is one I took in my Oakland neighborhood and printed onto silk. And then I created this exuberant skateboarder who appears to be being watched by that police car in the background. Next. The second piece that the de Young chose to exhibit is called Floating into the Heat of the Moon. In this one, an imaginary young man is shown against an improbable field of butterflies. I'm very proud to say that at the close of the de Young, at the close of the show, the de Young chose to acquire this piece for its permanent collection. Next. Let me say in conclusion that I'm not a trained artist. What I have learned, I have learned largely from books. There are millions of books that can teach you how to draw people. And now even more, um, now uh, you have in addition, YouTube videos, which weren't around when I got started. You have to either learn or to be able to intuit the objective ratios that apply to drawing the human body. The kind of thing that da Vinci was famous for understanding the relationship between the size of the head and the length of the body, for example, or that the face, everybody's face is divided into thirds, that ears line up with the top of the eye. This is all objective knowledge and it's not a closed book exam. I usually have my art books open when I'm constructing a figure so I can check against these rules to see if I have gotten the proportions correct. I firmly believe that almost anyone can learn to draw that it's just as teachable as anything else, and that what holds most of, most of us back is our notion of ourselves that, quote, I can't draw. I think you can get there the same way I got there and the way you get to Carnegie Hall. Practice, practice, practice. That's it. Thank you for coming along on my journey with me, and thank you to the King County Library System for making this possible. Thank you so much, Alice. Um, we do have a couple questions in the chat and we have a few minutes left. Um, okay. If folks do have additional questions, you can put them in the chat and just use the drop down and choose KCLS RECA and I will be able to see those and ask those questions for you. 
Um, so the first question I see is, um, uh, I wish and I hope this lecture and slides will be in a printed book. Um, are your are your works available in a in a printed format like a book? Here, here are, they are they available. are available. Oh, I'm oh, getting feedback. Well, let me. Yeah. See. I'll be. I'll mute. Okay, they are available in many books, none of uh, which I have written myself, but. Um, most of the shows that I have exhibited work in have done catalogs or books or what have you. And um, I had um, um, some pieces that were exhibited by the US Embassy and they did a lovely, you know, um, kind of a brochure for visitors to their uh, embassies that, you know, that, that they shared with them. And, um, and it, it's also been in a number of books of art quilts and they've been in a lot of places, but I haven't written my own book. I'm too busy <laughs> making art, <laughs> trying to write a book. <laughs> okay, here's another question. How do you see your current work in the context of quilting history? Okay, okay. That's, that's, I'm still getting, okay. Um, the repre the um, traditional quilting occupied as you know hundreds of years of the lives of mainly women, you know, and they're beautiful uh, and they're traditional. And the art quilt movement began, I would say, um, not significantly until about the nineteen nineties. Um, and so I had begun doing them um, in the late 80s. And um, usually I don't call myself an art quilter. Most, most women, well, women, most people who, who do fabric art hate that term. And the reason that they hate it is not that they don't respect traditional quilting. It's just that people get something fixed between their ears when you say the word quilt. And the first words out of their mouth is my grandma. And no, it has nothing to do with your grandma, you know, frankly. So uh, I see my work and most of the artists who are my contemporaries who work in a similar vein or work in, in uh, fabric art, we see ourselves as artists, you know, and we are just using a medium of the quilt. So, I, you know, um, I hope that explains it. <laughs> Okay, here's another one. You speak about your fabric choices. Are you as particular about your thread? How do you incorporate the stitches into your pieces? Okay, my personal choice is to de-emphasize the stitch line. That's why I use such a very, very fine silk thread. It's a hundred weight silk thread. I, I, I match it to the fabric, but generally I kind of want that line to disappear. I want the piece to speak through the um, the the uh, collage, if you will, of the of the fabrics, rather than through stitch lines. Now, sometimes, as you on some of those um, uh, undercurrent pieces of the bodies floating uh, underwater, the stitch line is somewhat significant because it's kind of showing the waves, you know, of the water. But for me. Um, I find that if you're trying to do a face, for example, and you have a lot of lines, like a contour drawing, that can be very disorienting for people to see. It's not fluid. It's, uh, it, it, it's, it's a separation. I mean, you couldn't imagine a painter, you know, having lines all through, you know, uh, his subject, you know? So I find that it, that it interrupts more than helps, except, Sometimes it doesn't, so <laughs> every rule is made to be broken, but uh, I personally choose to de-emphasize the thread. Not every artist makes that decision. How long does it take you to complete a single piece? Everybody time. wants to know. And the answer is always 30 years, <laughs> you know, because if you haven't had the history, you can't start off there. But seriously, it just, it just varies. Uh, Frankly, um, um, 
I, I take as long as my deadline allows, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm not a, um, well, I could be known to push a deadline. So uh, I'm working on a piece now that's a, a large um, uh, commission piece. And I've been on this since, uh, what month is this? I've been on this since January, I think, and I'm maybe halfway through, but this is a very big piece, maybe February. It's a very big piece, and I've still got a long way to go, but say la vie. Another question for you is, uh, who are your artist muses, or where do you find inspiration besides your family and your life? You know, the whole world, you know, really, because uh, people are generally what I'm focusing on. I'm taking pictures, you know, a lot of the time, getting the getting the poses of people, the, the newspaper, for God's sake, <laughs> you know, I could I could do stuff out of the newspaper for the next 20 years, you know, the things that are just making me crazy. Um, I have a uh, quilt artist that I admire, or artist, fabric artist that I admire a great deal. One of my favorites is Visa Butler, who has a show currently at the at the uh, Chicago with um, Chicago Inst Art Institute. Fabulous! She does she does fabulous work, absolutely fabulous. And and you should all look her up online if you're not familiar with her work. We have similar styles. I would say that not too many people work in my style some but not too many but uh visa and i you know we we tried similar routes we're not identical by any means and um i i like the um old masters because i'm doing representational art and they that was a high period for representational art so even I mean, I began doing this when representational art was completely out of favor. And I said, I don't care. I really enjoy doing this. And frankly, the art world has caught up <laughs> you know, too. So it's, it's a lot more in favor than it was when I began doing this 30 years ago. Does any of your fabric art ever contain any favorite clothing items of your own or a family member? or from a favorite bedspread to add an emotional value? No, I'm not, I, I don't use, um, you know, secondhand fabrics or whatever. I am looking for, I am, it's, it's like trompe l'oeil. I am looking to create the image of the thing, not to put the thing on my, on my, on my piece. So, you know, people are always trying to give me buttons or or necklaces or what have you but you know I want to make something that looks like a necklace something that looks like a button the one exception is I've used zippers in two pieces where they absolutely were appropriate you know one is called um I always try to keep an open mind and there's a zipper <laughs> coming down out of my head <laughs> so and another one was a piece that I did of Trump where a um, a, uh, he is essentially wearing a, he's, I, anyway, I depict him as an alligator and there are snakes pouring out of his <laughs> zipped up <laughs> front, you know, so whatever. Anyway, anyway so generally, no, I, I don't use, um, uh, you know, other, other fabrics or other bed spreads or anything like that. Um, we have time for a couple more. As you tweak your layers during the design process, are there any, how many layers is too many? Uh, and <laughs> then it says uh, referencing the five layer dress. Yeah, right. Well, I will say that I no longer do what I did. That was, a, that was kind of an early, much earlier piece. Nowadays, I would cut away the, the underneath layers and stop building her up like the princess and the pea, you know. I would, uh, you know, so I would either take off those underlying layers or cut them out from behind or something um, nowadays. So 
how many layers, I don't know. I, it, I, I, it's all trial and error for me. You know, I think any artist, that's what they're doing. They're putting something down, they're looking at it. Mm, yeah, mm, no, yes, no. You know, they're picking it up or they're adding to it or they're, you know, what have you. That's, that's anyway, that's how I work, you know. So there's no such thing as too many attempts to capture something right. I get to it faster now than I did back then. <laughs> <laughs> are the is the majority of your pieces have sewing in them or do you use other things like fusible interfacing yes and no uh everything is fused everything is fused i use a, a fusible um fabric called misty fuse which comes on a bolt and um i fuse Every single piece that goes down has a fusible backing on it. However, I don't trust that over time that that fusing is going to hold it. So everything is also sewed down, you know. So, um, and when I add my backing, which is these days felt, I have to sew again because although that backing is also fused down, fused to the back of the piece. I have to sew through the front in order to make sure that it remains attached forever between uh, to make that sandwich. And are your uh, is most of your sewing hand sewing or do you use machine sewing as well? Uh, I like to say if I used hand sewing, I'd still be making my first piece. Because <laughs> never use hand sewing because <laughs> I'm not that. I'm trying to accomplish something not not show how well I can make a little stitch. I'm just have, I, I really don't have any interest myself in um, uh, doing the uh, meticulous stitching that grandma did, you know. It's, it's, I'm about creating that image and I wanna create it as fast as I can, you know, and, and hand sewing is not, you know. I mean, I could, you know, add decorative handwork to a piece, but I don't. It's just not my thing. Okay, I think we've gone through all the questions that I'm seeing in the chat. So I just want to say thank you again, uh, Alice. This has been really wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. And thank you everybody for coming tonight. Um, uh, you'll see uh, the link to Alice's website in the chat. Um, I also want to invite everyone to look at our um, other Juneteenth programs that KCLS is doing this week um, at kcls.org forward slash Juneteenth. Um, we'll have uh, events all week. So please uh, come join us again. Um, thank you again, Alice. We are so happy and, and privileged that you were able to come and do this talk with us. Thank um, you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to KCLS. Thank you, everybody.